All right, now we're joined by Stephen Paolini, who is here to tell us to vote, vote yes on Initiative 1639. So go ahead, up to cool. five minutes to tell us why to vote Sweet. yes. Thanks so much, guys, uh, for letting me be here. Uh, my name is Stephen Paolini. I am the campaign manager for Initiative 1639, Safe Schools, Safe Communities. This initiative is the most comprehensive gun violence prevention measure in the history of the state of Washington. Uh, it does quite a few things, and I'll start with just a, just a quick description of the main thrust of the proposal. Uh, it's real simple. Uh, we endeavor to make sure that it is at least as hard to purchase a semi-automatic assault rifle as it is to purchase a handgun. So a couple of things that goes into that. First is raising the age to purchase a semi-automatic assault rifle from 18 to 21. Second is requiring basic training and an enhanced background check. Uh, which includes the most up-to-date local law enforcement records uh, that the state of Washington has to offer. This initiative also goes just a bit further in requiring a 10-day waiting period before purchasing a semi-automatic assault rifle. This is an incredibly important piece of the policy because it allows a cooling down period for buyers of these extremely deadly firearms. Um, this is a measure that will help reduce suicide as well as homicide. And it also gives local law enforcement the time they need to fully conduct and complete the background checks before the sale is complete. In addition, this measure affects all firearms by creating a standard of secure storage. What goes into this is it holds law-abiding uh, law and responsible uh, gun owners accountable if their irresponsible or negligent storage of a firearm leads to a crime because it was able to be accessed by a prohibited person, whether that be because they are a child or somebody barred from purchasing a firearm for another reason. This is an extremely important piece of the policy because it, a majority of um, mass shootings occur because somebody is able to gain access to a firearm from a family member or a friend or somebody else that was irresponsibly or unsecuredly stored. Uh, so that's the sort of crux of the measure. Um, it has been a really exciting campaign uh, so far. Uh, we launched the fastest ever signature gathering drive in the history of the state of Washington. We had just 25 days to collect over 378,000 signatures. That is a pace of over 15,000 a day. Or one of my favorite stats, one signature every six seconds. Uh, we were able to do that against all odds because of tens of thousands of volunteers and supporters that collected signatures for this initiative. Um, a fun couple stats on this, uh, two thirds of all signature gatherers live outside of the city of Seattle and over half of them had never been involved with the gun violence prevention initiative or movement before Parkland. So this is a campaign that is powered by young and old activists, and I mean that by experience, not age. Um, and we have just been so overexcited excited to see the overflowing uh, support for common sense gun reform across the state of Washington. It is the goal of this campaign to win in every legislative district in the state of Washington. Um, and we are kicking off our uh, statewide um, press tour and local campaign kickoffs this week. Uh, we started in Seattle uh, with with uh, high school students from Rainier Beach High School um, speaking about their involvement with the campaign and we'll be this weekend on the road to Vancouver, Vancouver and Tacoma. Next weekend we'll be in Yakima, Spokane and Squim and the weekend after that we will be up in uh, Whatcom County and Snohomish County. Um, so we're really excited to travel all across the state of Washington and talk about a law that we know will save lives. Uh, the data is extremely clear. Uh, we have a gun density problem in this country. Uh, this measure will help to uh, create some real common sense reforms uh, that will not affect law-abiding gun owners, but rather will, will keep us safe. Uh, so that's where I'll end, and thank you guys so much for the time to speak. Great, so now we'll open up to follow-up questions. I'll ask one and then Ben. Um, so we reached out to um, the no side and they did not get back to us, so we will not be interviewing them. I'm wondering if you could just tell us what are the arguments against, and then maybe respond to those. So we. Sure. So we, we um, know what the response would be. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, st I'll start with by saying that you're actually not the only organization that's had this problem uh, with reaching out to the opposition and not getting response. Uh, we had an endorsement meeting with the Everett Herald um, a few days ago. Uh, they did not decide to show up to that. Uh, there are other endorsement meetings and editorial meetings that they're deciding not to show up to for whatever reason. I think the most uh, obvious reason is that their arguments are not compelling. Uh, there are 
really no reasonable arguments against this measure. Uh, there are a lot of lies that they will share about it. Uh, they will say things, for example, like this uh, gun measure will uh, criminalize self-defense. Uh, it's an argument predicated on a totally false and um, misrepresentative um, description of how the safe storage laws work. Um, the safe storage laws, uh, I think, are, are the thing piece of the policy that need the most explanation. Um, but it is actually real clear. Uh, it establishes a standard of negligence. Uh, so in order to be prosecuted under this law for an irresponsibly stored firearm or for uh, community endangerment, as it's called in the law, uh, there has to be a reasonable expectation that the firearm you have unsafely stored uh, would be able to be accessed readily by a prohibited person. So for example, one of the messages the opposition uses is that if your home is broken into, uh, and somebody uh, gains access to your gun and uses it in a crime, you'll be held liable for that. That is false. Um, you do not have a reasonable expectation that somebody will break into your home and thus under this law would not be prosecuted. In addition, you are cleared of all liability if you report within five days uh, of knowing that your firearm was stolen to local law enforcement. And that is a requirement under the measure. Um, other municipalities have, have uh, created similar policies, but there are some key differences between what is required in Seattle uh, and up in Edmonds and what was required under this initiative. Uh, the main piece of that is that we do not mandate a kind of storage. We simply create an accountability if folks do not follow uh, a responsible standard of storage. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, does 1639 affect the uh, sale and purchase of firearms at gun shows? Yeah, so uh, the, the state of Washington passed a universal background check law in uh, 2014, uh, Initiative 594, which was the first initiative conducted by the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. This is now the third. Um, so all of the provisions under uh, this measure would fall within the universal background check requirements, which includes uh, back, uh, gun shows. So the answer is yeah. Additional <laughs> <laughs> questions? Um, impressive numbers on the uh, gathering of signatures. Uh, was that a total volunteer effort or did you use hired uh, signature yeah. gatherers? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there were paid signature gatherers. Uh, we had quite a few uh, paid staff like myself and organizers um, <clears throat> that are given salaries to help coordinate volunteer efforts. Um, we had uh, very similar numbers to many of the other initiatives in terms of volunteer versus paid signature gathering. Um, yeah. Thank you. Bridget. Um, did you work with law enforcement in the creation of this initiative and have they yeah. been supportive? Totally. Uh, so law enforcement, both on the side of uh, police and sheriffs, but also on the side of prosecutors, um, were involved with the crafting of this policy and have been involved very readily with the Alliance for Gun Responsibility's work over the last several years. Uh, one of the most exciting things that we've seen in our partnership with law enforcement uh, on this particular issue of gun violence prevention uh, is their willingness to help with implementation. And that's something that we'll hope uh, that they will continue to participate in on 1639. Uh, the last policy that the Alliance passed, Initiative 1491, the Extreme Risk Protection Order, was a policy that really benefited from some interdisciplinary and multi-jurisdictional help from law enforcement. Um, we looked at a, a, just sort of a, a cross-study of, of how many extreme risk protection orders had been completed and, and domestic violence protection orders, and we were seeing that the policies weren't being effectively implemented. Uh, so the Alliance for Gun Responsibility partnered with local jurisdictions and uh, were able to establish um, uh, a unit here in King County uh, that's really leading the way across the state uh, and we, uh, in the last uh, trial period of only a few months, we were able to remove more firearms than had been previously collected in the last year. And what that really comes down to is folks that had um, been uh, prohibited from purchasing a firearm because of a domestic violence protection order, so a history of abuse of women uh, or of partners. Uh, and it was so crucial that we get that firearms away from them as quickly as possible. Um, so. So law enforcement are really readily involved uh, in, in all of this, and, and we hope that they'll continue with their partnership, especially uh, in implementation. Uh, Mitzi, uh, the King County Sheriff, uh, signed the voter guide statement for 1639. Great. Okay. The, uh, the secure storage aspect of the initiative sounds a little bit on the subjective side. Is there an objective, um, clear uh, 
uh, guideline that's laid out, or or is it up yeah. to some judge somewhere? It's there is uh, you know jurisdiction within the prosecutor's offices to determine uh, what qualifies as, as negligence uh, or community endangerment under the law. However, I mean we have a pretty long-standing precedent for how similar laws like this work. Uh, so you know while it is subjective in that you know prosecutors have some discretion to decide whether or not they will take a case. The standard is pretty clear within the courts. Thank you. <coughs> Additional questions? Um, sure. I'm, I'm curious why we started the right only 25 days. Mm -hmm. The Alliance for Gun Responsibility was committed to getting this policy passed the way it's supposed to get passed, which is within the legislature. Um, we were really excited, um, or optimistic rather, about the opportunity um, to pass this policy, especially in the wake of the Parkland shooting. We had hoped that the legislature felt the same way we did, which was enough is enough. Uh, gun violence is preventable, and we can take a serious step here in Washington State to lead the country and uh, keeping our schools and communities safe. Uh, we got extremely close in the legislature, but were ultimately unable to pass that policy. Um, and we wanted to stay extremely focused on that goal of doing this the way it's supposed to be done through the legislature. Um, and so we were obviously disappointed and, and taken off guard the legislature decided to make that absurd decision not to pass the policy uh, when it, it was clear in the last two initiatives that there has been a mandate to pass such policies and it was clear in the wake of the Parkland shooting that the people of Washington uh, desperately were demanding um, that this policy be passed. Uh, I mean you should have seen the efforts in Olympia. Uh, you know hundreds of high school students coming down and testifying and pleading with their elected officials to pass a measure as simple as raising the age to purchase a semi-automatic assault rifle from 18 to 21. Right? I want to remind everyone that that's literally what's already required for handguns. It's absurd that if there is a, a, a lighter requirement to purchase an AR-15 than there is to purchase a handgun. Um, and, and the fact that the legislature couldn't do just that should surprise everyone, and it did surprise us. Um, and we were really committed to getting that done in the legislature, and unfortunately we couldn't, so we ended up having to start late. Uh, the second piece I'll just add is the National Rifle Association has sued us three times. They sued us when we initially proposed the ballot title language uh, in an attempt to lessen and shorten the amount of time we had to gather signatures. They thought that would be enough to keep the initiative off of the ballot, and obviously they were wrong. Uh, so that was another uh, piece where that really condensed the time when we started from about 60 days to a little under 30. Uh, what kind of opposition does uh, the initiative face? How much money um, is that opposition put against it. Yeah, I think there's three ways in which the opposition really takes its forms. The first is they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, uh, both in trying to prevent the initiative from having time to collect signatures, but then twice more over what ended up being a totally fallacious argument that the Supreme Court overturned. Uh, so that's been, you know, step one. They've delayed us over and over again uh, with the amount of time we have to gather signatures and then the amount of time that we have to communicate with voters. Um, the step two is that the National Rifle Association has formed a ballot committee in opposition to 1639. They currently have a little bit over $150,000 that they're slated directly for uh, direct voter contacts. So that'll be over the phone or at people's doorsteps or in the mail or on TV, however they choose to strategize. And the third thing is that we're fighting against a long-standing precedent. Washington State is among um, the most uh, the, place, the states in which the National Rifle Association spends the most directly contributing to candidates. Uh, so we are fighting against a history uh, and a long-standing sort of deadlock that the National Rifle Association has, has uh, indoctrinated the state with. Uh, and so uh, the opposition, I, I don't believe, will be sophisticated. Um, I think the fact that they're not here you know, to meet with you guys is, is proof enough of that. Uh, but nonetheless, we're, we're fighting against a, a shortened clock they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to create, and we're fighting against uh, a long-standing history of, of, uh, of efforts here in Washington State to indoctrinate our electeds. And I think that's why our goal of, of winning in every legislative district is just so important. Uh, we got really close two years ago with Initiative 1491, and I hope we'll, we'll meet our goal this year to really assert uh, the kind of mandate that I think we all know is true about the state of Washington, which is that folks want the policies that we're proposing. We have time for a couple more questions if people have them. Jason? I have the impression that this initiative can serve as model legislation yeah. nationally. Can you compare this effort 
with other efforts nationwide? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, so this policy does a lot of things that some states already have. Um, so the requirements on local uh, background checks for uh, purchases of semi-automatic assault rifles and even for handguns, uh, the basic training requirements, uh, the safe storage requirements are all pieces that some states have one or two or three of. Uh, but the fact that we're creating a standard in two ways. First, we're showing what it looks like to have all of them in one state and combined with universal background checks and good extreme risk protection order laws. Uh, but we're also creating a playbook, right, which is, like I said, you know, the state of Washington has had a lot of money uh, in direct candidate contributions from the National Rifle Association. And so we've been able to show other states, here's the playbook for how you take down the NRA and how you reduce their, uh, you know, how you, how you make a dent in the armor, right? How you reduce their arguments to stuff that just doesn't resonate with voters. What we've shown over the last you know, five years since the Alliance for Gun Responsibility uh, was founded uh, is that the National Rifle Association's respect in the eyes of Washington voters has diminished significantly. And their respect in the eyes of the legislature has reduced, uh, been reduced significantly. We've already gotten requests um, from national conferences uh, for after the election uh, to, to present um, our findings for what this policy can uh, you know, uh, create and, and how to get the policies like this passed. One of the things we just uh, announced last week from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility was a toolkit from the Extreme Risk Protection Order uh, law that we've been working on implementing and passing. Uh, it's a, a uh, collaborative effort from several uh, gun violence prevention organizations, including uh, Gabby Giffords Foundation um, and several others. Uh, and it is essentially a, a play-by-play guide to how to pass an extreme risk protection order. Uh, we will certainly do the same thing after this uh, policy passes as well. And I do think that this is a model for the country. Um, you know, after extreme risk protection orders passed, it has become a part of the national dialogue. Uh, after Parkland in Florida, one of the first things on everyone's uh, tongue was an extreme risk protection order. Uh, and I think that will, will follow with this policy as well. Uh, it, is, it is extremely well crafted, and I think it creates the foundation uh, for really comprehensive reform. Time for maybe one more question. Anybody has one? All right. Well, then you have up to two and a half minutes for a closing statement if you got one. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, really looking forward to hopefully working with, with uh, uh, this uh, legislative district and with many of the volunteers and supporters uh, that you guys work with uh, to get this policy passed. Uh, like I said, we're really taking no place in the state of Washington for granted. That's why every ounce of, of your guys' support is so meaningful uh, because we are not just planning to win, uh, we're planning to win big. Um, I had a conversation with, uh, with a candidate um, in uh, central Washington the other day and, and they were saying uh, they were not sure if they were going to support Initiative 1639 and we went back and forth for a while and uh, by the end of the conversation it was clear I, I couldn't convince them uh, uh, because they were just dead set on the idea that their constituents didn't support it. Well what I told them is, is something that I hope you all uh, believe in and fight for which is uh, that we should talk after the election because I told her that um, in all likelihood we'll get more votes than she will. So. I think that's uh, our, driving, our driving goal, our driving message for every elected in the state of Washington. If you're unsure about how you feel about this policy, check in with me after the election because we will get more votes than you will. So, uh, thanks so much, guys. Thank you very much.